Okay, so good morning again, everyone. Uh, we'll start now. Um, message here. Yeah, Yashwant, I've started the recording. Okay, so uh, yeah, so welcome to E2212. This is matrix theory. Um, so before we begin, some general uh, guidelines are, uh, let's keep our videos off. I'll switch off my video in a minute. I turned it on so you can see me uh, during the first class. I'll turn it off in a minute or two. Uh, and also keep your microphones muted. This will avoid uh, noise uh, into, the, into the class. And uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, But if I don't see your hand raised, uh, just unmute yourself and uh, you can start speaking and I will answer your question. OK, so uh, before we begin, um, let's maybe discuss uh, the organization of the course. This is a new experience for all of us to attend a class online. And so we'll probably have to be a bit flexible and make things up as we go along. But uh, roughly, this is uh, the outline that I've thought for this course. So this uh, this file itself has been shared with you um, in the teams. So specifically, I'll show it to you in the um, in my teams. So if you go to teams and you click on uh, the class uh, class team and you go to files and then class materials, then there are two things here. One is this file that I'm showing you, which is the course outline, and the other is the textbook by uh, Horn and Johnson, which is the primary textbook I will be using for this course. OK, and uh, you will incidentally find uh, posts and other things related to the course uh, out here under posts, and uh, some cr crucial announcements are in the announcements tab so that uh, you can have uh, you can have them all the announcements related to the course in one place. Um, OK. So coming back to the course outline. So this is E2212 matrix theory. And uh, in this course, basically we'll study the basics of matrix theory. And I'll also talk about some applications to engineering. Um, this is the course web page and uh, typically I'll try to mirror all the announcements that are put up on Teams on the web page, but um, just to avoid confusion for you, all, all the announcements related to the course will be available on Teams so that you don't, don't really need to go out Teams. Yeah, looks like I lost internet connection for a few minutes. Um, is Can somebody confirm if you're able to hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you now. Yes, OK, sir. thank you. So uh, incidentally, if um, uh, if I lose internet connection, don't panic, just wait. Uh, hopefully uh, the internet will resume after a minute or two and I will be able to reconnect with you. OK, so. Um, yeah, so coming back to the course outline, the two TAs, Chirag and Nagbushan. Chirag, you're here. Would you like to say hello? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Chirag. Um, I'll be a TA for your course this time. Yeah. Hey, Nagbushan, are you around? Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, guys. Yeah. Yeah. So both are excellent students, so you can ask uh, your questions and doubts to them also. Uh, there are going to be two office hours, which is going to be Tuesdays and Wednesdays, 5 to 6 p.m. And a problem session, a solving session, which will be on Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m. So the formal material of the course will be covered during these classes. These are additional times where you can get some help for your course, but it's not mandatory to attend these, uh, these sessions. 
But of course, if you have doubts, um, this is a good time to get them clarified from the TAs. And also the problem solving session, um, there just won't be enough time to do a lot of problem solving in class for this course. And so um, if you want to see some example problems being solved, you should attend the problem solving session. For the grading of this course, I currently have a tentative plan of having two midterms and a final in addition to quizzes and assignments. And all four parts will have equal weightage. I'm also debating whether to have one midterm and final and have a higher weightage for the quizzes and assignments. That depends on how easy it is to administer and uh, grade an exam. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll decide that in a few weeks time. But meanwhile, the, this is the tentative plan that your quizzes and assignments will be worth 25% of your grade. And uh, the two midterms and the final will all be worth 25% of your grade. Now, um, one thing I realize is that uh, given the pandemic situation, it's uh, necessary to plan for the possibility that um, some of you may fall sick, uh, unfortunately, during the uh, time which we have uh, fixed for the exam. And so this is going to be my policy. I, I don't want to have uh, re-exams. And so if you miss an exam because of health reasons, then you do need to submit a letter showing that uh, you were indeed sick and that's why you had to miss a test. Um, and in case you miss one test, then your points from the other two tests will be used to prorate your marks for the test you missed. But if you miss two um, or more tests, then you will get a zero on the test, the tests that you missed. And we will prorate based on the tests that you've taken, but then your overall grade may be very poor. Homeworks uh, are assigned uh, roughly once in two weeks. These homeworks will not be graded and you don't need to turn them in but we will have a quiz or assignment approximately once every week which will have a problem which one or two problems which are very similar to the homework problems these will be announced uh, in class and you'll have to turn in your solution um, within one or two hours after the class so um, and then the, there will be a series of assignments we'll choose the best 10 scores to determine your score on these homeworks Textbooks, I have listed four textbooks here. The first textbook is by Horn and Johnson. It's Matrix Analysis. Uh, this is the textbook I will be following uh, fairly closely. And uh, the other textbooks, depending on the part, for some part of the course, I will, for example, use Golub and Van Loon. Some computational aspects are covered better there. And Gilbert Strang is listed because it's a good undergraduate level textbook. So if you find Horn and Johnson a bit difficult. It's a good idea to go back and forth between uh, Horn and Johnson and Gilbert Strang. There are also a series of uh, very excellent uh, video lectures at an undergraduate level on uh, linear algebra. So I very strongly encourage all of you to take time to go over these video lectures. Um, and in fact, uh, for the most part, I'm assuming that you are comfortable with the material in these uh, video lectures. This is a graduate level class, so I, I will uh, basically summarize uh, things that you should know from your undergraduate uh, linear algebra um, modules. Uh, almost every undergraduate program that I'm aware of does have a part on linear algebra, so I'm assuming that you are uh, aware of this and you are familiar with it, and we will take go forward from there. Sir, we lost audio again, sir. We can't hear Your you. Your mic is muted. So you're muted, sir. Oh, I don't know how my mic got muted. How long ago did I get muted? Just 10 seconds, sir. Okay. Yeah, so I was basically done. I was just saying that the last part is the course outline, which you can look at on your own. Um, those are the topics that we'll be covering in the course. OK, so with uh, with that, at this point, in terms of course organization, are there any questions? Sir, 
So, is there any prerequisite for this course? Yeah. So, I the the prerequisite is undergraduate level linear algebra. So, I'm assuming that you've taken an an undergraduate course, which uh, where ideas from linear algebra have been covered. So right off the bat, I also want to say that this is a graduate level class and uh, it will not be an easy class. So it's going to be a mathematical class. And so um, you can attend the first few lectures and decide if the, the class is suitable for you. Sure, sir. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions about the course organization? Hi, sir. Sir, do we need okay. some programming yeah. knowledge? And if yes, then in what? Not way? much. This is, uh, yeah, you will not require much programming uh, knowledge. This is a mathematical course, and uh, we will focus more on um, ideas, which we will state as propositions and theorems and proofs. So, um, as far as, uh, yeah, so there may be some small MATLAB assignments here and there, but they should be very elementary. Any other questions? OK, so we'll uh, we'll start. This is a, a whiteboard that I've already shared with you. Now, what I found is that uh, sharing the whiteboard with the team, unfortunately, um, what it does is uh, it um, also allows you to edit the whiteboard. Uh, this, uh, to me, is not desirable because um, uh, it's possible that you might accidentally um, clear the canvas or uh, overwrite something uh, or something like that. And uh, so I need to still find a, a better way to share these whiteboards. One way is I can save it as a figure and a picture and then post it in the class, which is probably what I will do. Um, but till I figure that out, um, this is the only whiteboard that I have shared so far. OK, so begin, before I begin uh, uh, introducing ideas uh, from the course, um, oh, something has gone wrong here. Okay. OK, that fixes it. OK, um, so the first question to ask is, why should we study linear algebra? Um, there are two, uh, there are a few primary reasons that I put here, but I'm curious to know if any of you have other reasons why you are uh, interested in this course. Um, whoops, I think I closed a whiteboard by mistake. Hold on. OK, are you able to see my, my whiteboard? Can one of you confirm? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I guess uh, I've already written the answers here. One one, you know, one obvious reason is that this is required. So you're, for example, if you are an MTech signal processing uh, student, then uh, you have to take uh, matrix theory. But it's also useful. I mean, after calculus and probability, or in addition to calculus and probability, this is probably the most useful mathematics uh, uh, that you can possibly learn. It's also very beautiful, and I will try my best to uh, give you a sense of that over the duration of this course. And uh, it's a, a topic of active research in its own right. So uh, building the background in linear algebra, if you are interested in doing research in mathematics, then Certainly, you need this background to even get started. And finally, uh, it allows you to solve very complex problems you, and uh, or prove very powerful results using uh, simple ideas. So these are some of the reasons why um, you might want to take this course. Does anybody else have a different reason why you're taking this course, just out of curiosity? So for machine learning. Yeah, so I would say that sort of covered in in, in this part. It's useful yes, in ML. 
it's useful in uh, in signal processing it's useful in communications and many 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 other fields yes okay so what is it what is it about so finally if if i had to distill down you know the contents of this course down to what it is all about it's just about these two equations ax equals b and ax equals lambda x so from your um, undergraduate linear algebra you will recognize ax equals b is what we call a linear system of or a system of linear equations and the ax equals lambda x is the eigenvalue eigenvector equation so it's really about understanding these two equations and everything that you can say about these pair these this pair of equations and that's what this uh, this course is all about so but then it turns out you, you can actually say a lot about these two equations and um, what i will in fact cover in this course is going to be a, a small sample of what you can say about these two equations it still will not be anywhere near being exhausted so there are a few caveats i want to point out um, right off the bat um now again this uh, something has gone wrong here okay yeah so one thing is that in any mathematical course uh, during the class when arguments are presented to you it looks very simple i i can assure you of that or it looks fairly simple and you feel like you understand everything but it's very important to spend time outside of class from uh, from day 1 um you should look at the textbook you should look for other material you should try to solve problems the class notes are not going to be enough and uh, when you solve problems you will realize that sometimes standard procedures don't work and uh, problems end up requiring you to look for some special way to handle some corner cases and in some ways it's also like learning a new language where we get comfortable ma making mathematical arguments now the textbook for this course uh, horn and johnson is a graduate level textbook it's a fairly dense textbook it's actually not easy to read um, but nonetheless it's a, it's a, it's a it has a, a very extensive uh, collection of results in the area and uh, one of my goals in this course is to get you to be comfortable with um, horn and johnson because it has so many useful results and uh, tomorrow in your research if you need uh, more advanced results from linear algebra you shouldn't have to hesitate to open the textbook and look for a result that you could possibly use and that comfort is really what i'm uh, that's really my goal is to get you to be comfortable enough with the textbook that you can open it up and look at it uh, whenever you need to the other final point i want to make before i begin is that um, this being an online class and that we are not physically meeting and all the homeworks and uh, uh, assignments related to grading are going to be administered in an online mode um it's really uh, an honor system that can only that's the only thing that can work here so i think intuitively you should know when um we are doing something that you are allowed to collaborate with your friends and peers and ask other people and uh, and figure out and when you should really be doing work on your own and submit your own work if you are in doubt please don't hesitate to ask me but um don't assume that what you have in other words if you are if you are not clear don't assume that uh, it's okay to collaborate or it's not okay to collaborate on a certain point you can always ask me um but the thing is that uh, there is really practically speaking there is no way i can or anybody can um monitor all of you and see that you are doing work on your own when you are supposed to be working on your own so what what i'm going to do is to assume that you are here because you want to learn this material and it's really your responsibility to make sure you get what you need to get out of this course 
Okay, any questions before I go to the other uh, um, other set of notes and begin? Okay, so let's begin. So I uh, will begin with a review of some basic concepts. Uh, uh, again, these are concepts that you should already know. And so if you're not comfortable with the things that I'm talking about now, then you should check whether this is really a course that you want to take um, uh, or not. So a matrix uh, is a rectangular array of symbols. In, uh, in the context of this course, it's always going to be real or complex numbers. So I can write a matrix A as a collection like this, containing A11 as its first entry, A12 as its second entry, A1n as its nth entry in the first row, A21, A22 up to A2n, AM1, AM2, and AMn in the last row. And uh, so this is what we call an M cross N matrix. And we write that this is in uh, the space real to the power m cross n or complex to the power m cross n if depending on whether these aijs are real valued or complex valued so always uh, when we write the i is going to represent the row index and j is going to represent the column index now we say A equals B if all entry wise, all the entries of the two matrices match. So all the entries should be equal. When you do A plus B, you can only do it if the two matrices are of the same size and it's an entry wise sum of the two, um, two matrices. That is the ijth entry of A plus B is the ijth entry of A plus the ijth entry of B. Lambda is a scalar here. It could be a real or complex number. Lambda times A corresponds to multiplying every entry of A with this value lambda. Here's a simple proposition. A plus B is the same as B plus A. That is matrix addition commutes. And it also dis it's also distributive. A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. Lambda times A plus B is the same as you first multiply A by Lambda, then you multiply B by Lambda and then add them together. Also, multiplying A by Lambda 1 plus Lambda 2 is the same as first multiplying A by Lambda 1, then multiplying A by Lambda 2 and then adding these two matrices together. Product also, this, this kind of rule applies. Next, uh, matrix multiplication. So um, I'll uh, start by talking about vector multiplication. So if you have a row vector, A1 to An, and a column vector, B1 to Bn, then uh, the product AB, these are two matrices, or two vectors that can be multiplied with each other. So this A is 1 cross N, and this B is N cross 1. And when I multiply them together, that's taking the sum of AI times BI, I equal to one to N. And so this is going to be a scalar. So with this, we can define matrix multiplication. If I have two matrices, A is of size M by N and B is of size N by P, then their product is a matrix of size M by P and it is defined such that its ijth entry is, the, is equal to the product of the ith row of A with the jth column of B. So I'll write this here. I goes from 1 to P, 1 to row index, so it goes to M and J goes from 1 to P. OK, and uh, matrix multiplication is uh, very useful in many contexts. It's uh, at this point, I must mention that this is a strange way of defining the multiplication of two matrices. So uh, for example, one could have thought of taking matrices of the same dimension and multiplying them element wise. 
okay or you could think about a matrix product as you take a given take every entry of matrix a and multiply it by the whole matrix b if you do that you will get a matrix when you multiply an m by n matrix with an n cross p matrix you'll end up with a matrix of size mn by np okay so that 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 kind of product it, it turns out we'll see that later also it's called a kronecker product when you take the element wise product of a and b which can only be done if a and b are of the same size then that is called the hadamard product but this is the usual matrix product as defined here um, it's a strange way of defining matrix multiplication and at this point the only uh, small uh, motivation i can give you um, but we'll see much more later is that it represents a composition of linear transforms so as it turns out um, a matrix uh, as i defined it earlier is a rectangular array of numbers but a more useful way to think about a matrix is to think of it as defining a linear transform so a matrix a in of size m by n is essentially defining a transformation from r to the n to r to the m and any linear transformation from r to the n to r to the m can be represented as a matrix a and if you take that viewpoint then uh, a matrix product ab actually corresponds to a composition of linear transforms so if you for example start with a from a dimension p space that is you start from r to the p then multiplication by b corresponds to take going from r to the p to r to the n and then if you go from r to the n space to r to the m space by using another linear transform a which is another matrix of size m by n then the joint effect of taking these two transforms one after the other can be represented by this matrix a times b as defined here another motivation i can give you is uh, we will uh, maybe much later in this course look at markov chains and uh, <coughs> uh, it turns out that if you look at um, associated with the markov chain is something called a transition probability and uh, a markov chain is defined by states s1 to sn and the probability that you will end up in state j starting from state i in the next step is uh, represented as a matrix whose entries are pij now if i ask what is the probability that i end up in state j starting from state i but not in one step of the markov chain but after say p steps of the markov chain then it turns out that this corresponds to taking the one step transition probability and multiplying it by itself p times so uh, and that multiplication again is defined in this way as defined here so think about it that uh, this um, this way of matrix defining matrix multiplication is really not intuitive uh, but it's useful in a variety of uh, scenarios and that's why we define matrix multiplication this way by the way among the caveats there is one thing that i wanted to mention which is that um, a lot of students i have seen have a tendency to think about uh, two cross two matrices or three cross three matrices in order to prove results so when they are faced with a result they would say let me take an example and then they take a 2 cross 2 or a 3 cross 3 matrix and show by example that whatever the statement they want to show is in fact true such a proof is not acceptable for this class what we want is that if if a statement does not say that it's valid for 2 cross 2 matrices only then we have to prove it in the general case we cannot show it in a 2 cross 2 or a 3 cross 3 case and consider that we are done okay so um this matrix multiplication as written here is not commutative in general meaning that <coughs> in general ab is not equal to ba in fact ab may be defined so here as as i have defined it here a is m by n and b is n by p so i can define ab 
but if uh, if m is not equal to p i cannot even define ba so in general ab is not equal to b okay here is another proposition continuing on ab times a matrix c is the same as a times b times c in other words um which matrices you multiply first and which one you multiply later doesn't matter but it is important to preserve the order of multiplication that is you cannot switch the order you cannot do instead of doing a b times c you cannot do c times a b or some other order similarly a times b plus c is the same as a times b plus a times c and a a plus b times c is the same as ac plus bc notice that again in all of these we are preserving the order in which we are multiplying the matrices so a times b plus c is not equal to ba plus ca for instance another very important matrix we'll be using in this course is the identity matrix this is denoted by i and if this matrix is n cross n and where there may be room for confusion i may write in to denote the n cross n identity matrix it's the matrix that has ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else and it has the property that a times the identity matrix if a is m by n then a times the n cross n identity matrix is equal to a and the m cross m identity matrix times a is also equal to a transpose taking the transpose of the matrix simply switches the rows and columns so the ijth entry of a transpose is the same as the jith entry of a we also define the hermitian of a matrix or the conjugate transpose of a matrix where not only do you switch the rows and columns so it ij becomes ji you also take the complex conjugate of the matrix so a plus b transpose is the same as a transpose plus b transpose the transpose of a transpose is the same as a and this is an interesting result and it's something that you can try to show that is if you want to take the transpose of the product of two matrices that's the same as taking b transpose times a transpose how would you show such a result you would take an ijth entry of ab transpose and then you would find the ijth entry of b transpose a transpose by considering an a general matrix a and b whose entries are aij and bij respectively and then you show that the ijth entries of these two matrices are matching another function that you can apply on a matrix is this. you can find its trace this is for square matrices so here it's an n by n matrix so the trace of a is the sum of its diagonal entries so another related result is that the trace of a plus b is the same as the trace of a plus the trace of b this is obvious because the diagonal entries will add and so if you want to take the sum of the diagonal entries you can first take the sum of the diagonal entries of a and then the sum of the diagonal entries of b and then add them together that's the same as adding the two matrices and then finding the sum of the diagonal entries when you multiply a by a scalar lambda then every entry of the matrix gets multiplied by lambda and so does all the diagonal entries and therefore trace of lambda a is the same as lambda times trace of a when you take the transpose of a matrix that keeps the diagonal entries where they are it only switches the off diagonal entries the rows become columns and columns becomes rows but then the diagonal entries remain the same so the trace of Uh, a transpose is the same as the trace of a it's not true for hermitian because when you take the hermitian you are doing the conjugate transpose so unless the diagonal entries are real valued the trace of a hermitian is not necessarily equal to the trace of a trace of ab so this is another interesting property that the trace of ab is the same as the trace of ba for compact matrices meaning matrices for which you can define both ab and ba but considering that we are looking at square matrices here 
when I define trace of AB, I'm assuming, I mean, notice that if I want to look at trace of AB, it's not necessary that A and B should be square, but AB needs to be square because trace is defined for square matrices. So AB is square and BA is also square, and it's such that you can find it, uh, AB and BA are both defined. They, in, in that case, you can write trace of AB equals trace of BA. Again, this is something that is worth as a small exercise for you to try to show. And once again, the, the way to show such a result is to simply write out what trace of AB will be in terms of the entries of AB, entries of A and entries of B. Write out what trace of BA will be in terms of the entries of A and the entries of B and show that these two things will be equal. So there are, as I mentioned to you a little earlier, there are two ways of looking at matrices. The first is that it is a rectangular array of scalars. That's a simple way to introduce matrices. That's why I started with that definition. But as I mentioned, the more useful uh, uh, viewpoint is that it represents a linear transformation between two vector spaces. So in order to understand that, we need to know what a vector space is, and that's what I'm going to define next. Um, are there any questions so far? Sir, when you scroll down, like when you're saying something and like we cannot see the screen part, like it takes some time, around one minute or sometimes more than that, for the screen to go down. Okay, okay. So then you find that I'm speaking something which is not visible to you on the screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try and keep that in mind. And uh, if you're not able to see the screen, feel free to interrupt me and say that you're not able to see the screen yet uh, so that I can pause and wait for it to show up at your end um, before I continue talking about whatever is written there. So it would also be helpful like if you can send this before the lecture so we can have a copy of this. Yeah. yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, what I found is that if I see all I need to do is to go here and then say post to teams. And uh, I can directly post this on teams, but I'm not happy with that approach um, because uh, that gives all of you edit permission on this uh, whiteboard. And uh, it's possible that somebody may accidentally delete. Um, or uh, mess up the whiteboard and so I need to find a better solution. One possibility I'm thinking is that I can save this as uh, I can export it to um, maybe a high quality image and then um, once I save it I can post this on Teams. I'll try and do that uh, prior to the class going forward. Uh, I'm also debating whether to uh, have the notes written out before the class or to um, write the notes as I teach. The writing the notes as I teach will slow down the lecture, um, which is a, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. The good thing about it is that um, uh, you get time to absorb what I'm saying while I'm speaking. Um, but uh, the bad thing is that sometimes the pen doesn't cooperate well with me and then it can become a little annoying to for you to see uh, things as I write down. If it um, uh, if the if the pen doesn't work very well, so we'll see. Maybe we'll try both ways and see which works better. Uh, sir, uh, you, other... said, uh, uh, you said you uh, said we should perceive matrix multiplication as a linear transform. So I mean, in lower dimension, it's very easy to say that I mean, when we do a linear transformation, uh, what happens? But in higher dimension, I mean, how should we ensure that this is a linear transform? Can you uh, repeat your question, please? Yes, sir. I was saying that uh, you said that I mean, uh, matrix multiplication we can perceive as a linear transformation. Right? Yes. So uh, I, I I was asking that uh, how can we I mean visualize it? Like in lower dimension, it's very easy to see that this is a linear transform, but in higher yes. dimension, let's say going from M to N, how can we prove it? Yeah. Or see? Yeah. So it, it turns out I mean that uh, we cannot visualize more than three dimensions. So if it's two dimensions or three dimensions, I can kind of draw things or 
I can show you what happens in three dimensions and so you can visualize it. But there is no hope of visualizing a linear transform from say six dimensional space to eight dimensional space or 16 dimensional space down to 14 dimensional space and things like that. You cannot visualize it. So it's a mathematical construction and you have to take it as such, but it is it, that is what it is doing. It is it's taking a vector from 14 dimensional space and then mapping it to say 23 dimensional space, something like that. So that's what it is doing. You cannot visualize it. So I wanted to understand. I mean, I mean, how, what does it distinguish that it is a linear transform and with a non-linear transform? So how can we distinguish between these two transforms? Okay. So yeah. this uh, this refers to how do we define linearity? Okay. So I'll come to that uh, in a little bit. Um, for that, I need to to understand this concept of vector spaces and how we define a linear transform between vector spaces. Okay. Okay. So you do need to understand. We we have to cover vector spaces before I can formally define what a linear transform is. But for now, I'm just saying that uh, there are two ways to visualize or view matrices. One is a rectangular array of scalars. The other is that a matrix represents a linear transform between a pair of vector spaces. And uh, the uh, the key point is that. Any linear transform, so I need to define vector spaces. So there is an object which is called a vector space. And if I define two vector spaces and uh, if I define a linear transform between these two vector spaces, that can be represented as one and only one matrix. So there is a unique mapping or a one to one mapping between linear transformations between two vector spaces and the space of matrices. So we'll come to that um, uh, shortly. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so let's start with uh, vector spaces. So um, a field let me just hold. Yeah, hold on one second. I just want to check that uh, the recording is still going on. Yes, it is going on. Good. OK. Um, so in order to define a vector space, we have to start with a field. A field is a set of scalars. And for the purpose of this course, we are only going to essentially focus on uh, real or complex field. So that is the set of all real numbers or the set of all complex numbers. So in the back of your mind, even though I write F here, think of it as a shorthand notation to say it's either real or it's complex. It's a set of scalars with two operations defined on it, plus and dot, and it's closed under plus and dot. That is, you take any two scalars and add them together, you'll get another scalar which belongs to this field F, and you take any two scalars and multiply them together. That's this dot symbol. Uh, then you will get another element that belongs to this field F. Both plus and dot are associative and commutative. There exists an identity element, both for addition and multiplication. Um, and every element has an additive inverse. So given any A belonging to F, there is a minus A which also belongs to F. And all elements except the additive identity, which is typically denoted by zero, have a multiplicative inverse and multiplication is distributive over addition. Again, this is a very uh, formal sounding definition, but uh, like I said, for the purposes of this course, just keep in mind that we are thinking about the real line or the complex plane and the usual multiplication defined in the real line or the complex plane or multiplication of complex numbers. So there's nothing new here, but um, there is a formal way to uh, define these things. I'm not going to deal with these too much, but this is, uh, I, I put these down mainly for the sake of completeness so that you know where these things come from. Now, uh, a vector space. A vector space, I'm going to use either S or capital, capital S or capital D 
a capital V to denote a vector space. It's defined over a field F and it satisfies two core properties. If I take X and Y belonging to this vector space S, then their sum X plus Y also belongs to this vector space S. And this sum is defined as element wise addition. If I take X belonging to this vector space S and any C belonging to this field F, then C times X also belongs to S. And the scalar multiplication is defined as multiplying every entry of this um, X. And these elements of S are called vectors. And addition and multiplication, which are used here, satisfy some a set of eight axioms, which I'm not going to list here. But again, for the purposes of this course, let's just think of it as element wise addition and multiplying every entry of this vector X by this scalar. So this X plus Y as defined here is actually taking a simple linear combination of these two vectors X and Y. A more general linear combination, if you are given vectors V1 through Vn in uh, each Vi belonging to R to the M, this is the M dimensional real space. That is a set of vectors with M real valued entries in them. And I is one to N, those are the N set of vectors. And if you are given scalars, i equal to 1 to n c i. Then if I define a vector y, which is equal to the summation i going from 1 to n, c i times v i, that is called a linear combination of these vectors v1 through v n. We also write it often by stacking these vectors v1 to v n as a matrix. Of, then this matrix will be of size m by n because each of these vectors are M dimensional vectors. And we stack the entries of the elements of this CI as a, as a column vector, C1 through CN. So this is N by one. And when you take this product of these, this matrix vector product as I defined earlier, then that's exactly the same as doing summation I equal to one to N, CI times VI. The moment we define um, linear combinations, we can define linear independence. So a set of vectors V1 through Vn are linearly independent when summation I equal to 1 to N Ci Vi equals 0, if and only if C1 equals C2 equals etc. equals Cn equals 0. It's important to take a minute and uh, digest uh, this definition. Uh, again, this is something you would have seen in your undergraduate uh, course, but um, one important thing I want to point out here is the if and only if condition. The if part is trivial here. Of course, if C1, C2 up to Cn are equal to zero, then summation Ci Vi is always going to be equal to zero. Zero times a vector is a zero vector. And so when you add up all the zero vectors, you will get another zero vector. This is a zero vector here. So the if part is trivial. So really the crux of this definition lies in the only if part. That is, there is no other linear combination of these vectors V1 to Vn that you can take and obtain the zero vector. So graphically, the way to think about it is if I have a vector, V1 like this, another vector V2 like this, then can I take a linear combination, scale this by C1, scale this by C2, add them together and then end up at the origin, get the zero comma zero vector. If I can do that, then these two vectors are linearly independent. If not, they are linearly dependent. It turns out that these two vectors are linearly independent and this is, um, this is something that should be obvious to you. And instead, if I take three vectors like this, now it turns out that I can always find a non-trivial linear combination of these three vectors such that I will end up at the origin. So three vectors in the two-dimensional plane are always going to be linearly dependent. And so we say that a set of vectors are linearly dependent if they are not linearly independent. 
Again, continuing with the theme of linear combinations, the span of a set of vectors V1 through Vn is the set of all Ys which can be written as linear combinations of these V1 to Vn. It turns out that this is a vector space, and again, this is something that you can try to show. It's, it's very easy to show this. The point is basically that if you take two vectors belonging to span of V1 to Vn, then the first vector can be written as a linear combination of Vi like this. And the second vector can also be written as a linear combination of these vectors. And therefore, their sum, so if it was, if the two vectors were y1 and y2, y1 plus y2 can be written as the sum of these uh, vectors with different coefficients ci. And therefore, that also lies in span of v1 to vn. And similarly, if you take, if you scale a vector y by some alpha, then that's the same as scaling each of these coefficients by the same factor alpha. And therefore, alpha times y can also be written as a linear combination of these vectors, and it belongs to the span. So it satisfies the two properties we said that a vector space should satisfy. And so the span of a set of vectors is, is actually a vector space. A related, um, a related uh, uh, object is the range space of a matrix A which is the set of all y's, which can be written as linear combinations of the columns of A. So y can be written as A times C for some C in R to the N. This is also a vector space. So essentially, the span of V1 to Vn is the same as the range space of a matrix whose columns are V1 to Vn. And the range space of a matrix is the same as the span of its columns. A subspace of a vector space is basically a subset of a vector space. So you take a vector space and you throw out some of the vectors and you retain the others, but it should satisfy a property that this subset of vectors is itself a vector space over the same field. When it does that, then we call it a subspace. So for example, if I take R2, then the set of all vectors, y belonging to r2 such that y2 equals 0. That is the second entry of y is equal to 0. This is a subspace. Clearly, if I take two vectors whose second entry is 0 and I add them together, the second entry cannot suddenly become non-zero. And so that also belongs to this set. And if I take a y which belongs to the set and I scale it by some alpha, then this, uh, the first entry will get scaled by alpha, but the second entry, which is 0, will remain equal to 0. So that will also lie in this subspace. <coughs> we say that a set of vectors v1 to vn span a vector space s if the span of v1 to vn is equal to this vector space S. Sir, uh, can you please uh, uh, once again elaborate on the subspace uh, part? So a subspace is nothing but a, a subset of the vectors in a vector space with the additional property that it should itself be a vector space. Okay, sir. Okay, and a vector space is one which satisfies those two properties that I showed you earlier. Yes, sir. Okay, the, the sum of two vectors in a vector space should be in the vector space. And scaling a vector by a scalar, you should say you should continue to live in that vector space. You can never leave. Yes. Sir. Okay. I often joke if the physical class, I often joke that vector spaces are like Hotel California. You can never leave. Whatever you do, these vectors, however they interact with each other, you will always stay in that vector space. OK, yes. so if, uh, if V1 to Vn span a vector space, then span of V1 to Vn is equal to the set S, this vector space S. In other words, any vector in this vector space 
can be written as a linear combination of V1 to Vn. And any linear combination of V1 to Vn is lying in this space. So this is another small point I want to make about, see the span of V1 to Vn is a set of vectors and S is also a set of vectors. And when you want to say two sets are equal, that is equivalent to saying if I take any vector in S that belongs to span of V1 to Vn. And likewise, if I take any vector which belongs to span of V1 to Vn, that lies in this set S. So they are equal. When this happens, we call V1 to Vn as a spanning set. Okay, of course, it means, like I said, this equality means that every vector in S can be expressed as a linear combination of V1 through Vn. Okay, so I uh, I think we we have reached here, and uh, the next concept I want to discuss is that of a basis, um, which we will do on Wednesday. Any um, any more questions before we close the class? Uh, sir, can you please explain this range of space once again? The range space is the same as the span. The range space of a matrix A is the same as the span of the columns of A. And mathematically, it's defined like this. It's actually the same as this definition here. To say that y is in R to the m, where y can be written as a linear combination of vi, is the same as saying that y is equal to a times c, where c is a vector in R to the n. It has n entries. It has c1 to cn as its entries. OK. Sir, is it equivalent to the column space of the matrix? Yes. So that's a good point. This is also called the column space. Uh, sir? Yes. Sir, could you explain a uh, span? So you take two vectors, okay, or in this case as defined here, where did I define it? Here. Span is the set of all linear combinations of these vectors, V1 to Vn. So in, in other words, if I take just to, again, I'm trying to avoid going to one and two dimensions because like I said, linear algebra is not limited to one or two dimensions, but that's all I can show you here on a, on a whiteboard. But if I take only one vector in two dimensional space and I ask what is its span, it's basically this line going through the origin. Okay, that's, that's all the vectors that you can represent as a linear combination of this one vector here. But if I take two vectors in the two dimensional space, then their span is actually the whole plane. As long as these two vectors are linearly independent. By taking different linear combinations of this, I can span the entire two dimensional space. If I take two vectors in three dimensional space and let's say I take one vector here and another vector here, then these two in this three dimensional space, but they will not span the entire three dimensional space. Okay, it's the set of all points that are reachable by taking a linear combination or taking the sum of scaled versions of the two vectors. Uh, sir, could you repeat the plain part? Your voice was not audible for a brief moment. Yeah, so all I was saying is that if I take axis and then this vector
Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Are you able to hear me? So uh, I think I lost internet uh, connection for a brief moment. But if this, this is the Y, this is Z, this is three dimensional space. Sir, then if I take two vectors, one along X. Hmm? Sir, whatever you are writing is not synchronized with what you are saying. Okay. So there is I'll a lag uh, between your video and audio. Yes. Yes. Are you able to see the three dimensional plane that I've drawn in blue? Three dimensional uh, axes that I've drawn in blue? Yes. Okay. Maybe what I will do is I'll stop sharing and share again. Just give me a minute. Okay, so hopefully now you will be able to see my screen. So if anybody is able to see the three dimensional plane, three dimensional axes that I've drawn, I've drawn the X, Y, Z axis. When yes. you're able to see it, please confirm. Yes, X, Y, Z. Yeah. So if I take two vectors, one vector along the X axis, another vector along the Y axis, you can see that if I take all possible linear combinations of these two vectors, I will span the two dimensional plane defined by the X and Y axis. There will be now no component in the Z direction. So it will span a two dimensional subspace of the three dimensional space. OK, and that is true even if I take any two non uh, coincidental vectors in the X, Y plane. Together they will span the entire X, Y plane. But they will never have any component along the Z direction. Every vector I take, which is a scaled version of the first vector, will not will have a zero as its Z component. So specifically, if I take V1 equal to say V11, V12, zero, and I take V2 equal to V21, V22, 0. It can't be 0, 1, and 1, 0. Any linear combination I take of these two vectors. C2, V2 will always be of the form V11 plus C2, V21. C1, V12 plus C2, V12, V22 and 0. So this third component will always be 0. So it will uh, always lie in the XY plane. Sir, we can't see what you're writing. It will come in a minute. Okay, so V1 and V2 span the XY plane. Any other questions? Uh, so Vishnu has his hand raised. Yeah, Vishnu, go ahead. Sir. Sir, earlier, can you can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, the thing is, uh, earlier you said that vectors can be represented as uh, columns of uh, matrix, right? Sir, vectors the can columns of a matrix are vectors. Yeah, columns of a matrix are vectors, right? So yes. is this uh, like uh, 
like is it is it uh, compulsory to use columns or can you use rows also yes so um, but in literature there is there it is mentioned as columns right mostly yeah so that's where they say you know there are three types of people in this world um the kind who think of vectors as column vectors the kind who think of vectors as row vectors okay so <laughs> Now, that was a bit of a joke, but uh, essentially a vector, when, as stated, could be a column vector or a row vector. The point is one of its dimensions, it is a, when you say a vector, we are thinking of a one dimensional vector. That is, it has one dimension, which is um, uh, where you have, say, n elements, and uh, it's a string of entries written in, along that dimension. You can represent it either as a row or as a column. And in fact, we'll use both depending on the convenience. Um, but definitely uh, from, uh, you know, it is true that um, vectors are often, it's most common to think of vectors as column vectors. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. So in fact, uh, if I go back here in my definition of matrix multiplication, I used both. I used a row vector and I used a column vector. Sir, what are the third kind of people? That's the joke. <laughs> okay. Sir, one more thing. Yes. Sir, uh, like uh, you are, uh, sir, matrix is uh, like linear combination between two vector spaces, right? Linear transformation, right? Yes. Sir, uh, like, Sir, we have matrices like M by M, right? M by M or something like that. M by uh, M, okay. Yeah, M by N or something. But M we don't by have N, okay. M by M by N. Like there are three, right? Tensors. Can, so I'm not discussing tensors just yet. Okay, that's tensors. Okay, okay. The matrix uh, by definition in this course is going to be of two, there are going to be two, two parts to it, M by N. That's it. Okay. So I will not be at at least in the for the most of the will not have. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll need another uh, another course to teach uh, tensor uh, mathematics. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we'll stop here. Uh, uh, thanks for attending. Um, sir, Ashi has a question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, in this last example, where you explained uh, the two dimensional vectors along uh, the axis x and y. So here we took these two vectors along the axis x and y, but if we take uh, these two vectors along a certain plane, I mean one vector along x, y plane and one vector along some other plane, say it, uh, y, x, y or y, z plane, then would it be three dimension, would it would be able to span the three dimensional space? Hmm, what do you think? Uh, sir, I guess we must uh, have uh, another vector to span three-dimensional space. Precisely. So that is one of the things that uh, we will show, which is that you cannot span three-dimensional space using just two vectors, no matter how you choose those two vectors. OK, if I take two three-dimensional vectors, OK, I can always find a vector in three-dimensional space, which cannot be reached as a linear combination of these two vectors. It makes intuitive sense, right? Because yes. if I take the three dimensional space like this, it's hard for me to draw it here. But if I take some vector like this, another vector pointing in some other direction, these two guys together define a plane. OK, yes, and sir. it's only guys, only vectors that sit in this plane that I can reach by taking linear combinations. There's always going to be a perpendicular direction, which is 90 degrees to both these guys. And anything that sits in this 90 degree direction cannot be reached by taking linear combinations of these two vectors. Yes, sir. 
ओके ओके सर थैंक यू वेलकम ओके सो आई गेस विल स्टॉप हियर फॉर टुडे एंड आई विल पोस्ट दिस रिकॉर्डिंग ऑन द टीम्स आफ्टर दिस क्लास